Thank you. So when I started college, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. But college is a time of, as we all know, self-awareness and self-discovery. And I learned that I'm really not good with my hands. And I also really don't like diseases. So luckily, I decided not to be a doctor, because it wouldn't have been a good match for me at all. And I actually ended up becoming a statistician. And so we've heard a lot in this session about how there's a difference between data and information and knowledge. And so what statistics really is, is the process by which you transform data into knowledge. And today, specifically, I'm going to talk about how we can use statistics in order to better understand cancer and move closer to a cure. So suppose that we have a bunch of women, and they all come into the clinic, and they all have breast cancer. Well, it turns out that breast cancer actually isn't a single disease. Two women who walk into the clinic who have the same age, who are the same age, who have the same size tumor, same stage, same grade, really seemingly similar diseases, could have very different outcomes. One of them might have a really aggressive form of the disease, whereas another woman might have a disease that's much less aggressive. And one woman's tumor might respond much better to treatment than the other woman's. And so there's really a lot of heterogeneity in breast cancer that we really don't understand. And maybe the problem is this picture. Maybe this isn't the right picture to be describing breast cancer at all. Maybe instead we should think of breast cancer like this where there's a few subtypes of breast cancer, maybe three. And so maybe instead of one disease called breast cancer, there's actually three distinct diseases. And if only we can find a way to sort of characterize these diseases and determine what type of breast cancer a woman has when she walks into the clinic, then we can treat her not for some average type of breast cancer that no woman actually has, but for her unique disease. So when a woman walks into the clinic, what do we know about her? Well, we can, we can obtain sort of standard clinical measurements. We can find out her age, and we can look at her tumor under the microscope. And that tells us a fair amount, but it doesn't tell us enough. Because, again, you can have two women who seem really similar to each other in terms of these standard clinical measurements, but who are going to have really different outcomes. And so up until a few years ago, we were limited by sort of the types of things you could find out about a woman by asking her questions and by looking at a biopsy of her tumor. But now the situation has changed, because in the last 10 years, the field of biology has been transformed. And all of these technologies have emerged that make it possible to obtain a really detailed molecular snapshot of what's happening within a given tissue, or even more recently, within a given cell. So for instance, biologists can uh, take a, a piece of tissue, and they can measure the extent to which various proteins are present. So they can look at huge numbers of proteins in a given tissue and see which ones are there in high levels and which ones are there in low levels. And you know, each one of your cells has uh, 25,000 genes in it. So biologists are now able to look at all 25,000 genes in a tissue and see which ones are highly expressed and which ones are present at low levels of expression. And more recently, it's possible even to sequence the entire DNA of a tumor. So you learned in high school biology that your DNA is 3 billion base pairs long, and that basically every cell of your body has the same DNA. But it turns out that's actually not really true. And it's especially not true if you have cancer, because cancer is characterized by having really strange DNA. There can be a lot of mutations in cancer's DNA, and there can be pieces of the DNA that are present in too many copies or that aren't present at all. And so what this means is that due to these amazing technologies that have come out in the last few years in biology, we can now obtain a very detailed molecular snapshot of what's happening within a given tissue or even within a given cell. And so we can characterize at a molecular level the heterogeneity that's going on within an individual's breast tumor. And this amounts to gigabytes of data. This is just a vast amount of data that we can now collect for a given woman. So the goal is, how can we use this data in order to understand and characterize these different subtypes of breast cancer so that if a woman walks into the clinic, we can determine what type of cancer she has and treat her accordingly. So a woman walks in. We're going to collect a lot of data for her, gigabytes of data. And we want to say, OK, based on this data, you must have the blue subtype of breast cancer. And we're going to treat you in an appropriate way. Another woman walks in. We collect the data. She has the red type of breast cancer. 
and a third woman has the green type of breast cancer. So this seems like a pretty simple idea, and I guess the obvious question is, why aren't we treating breast cancer better than we are? I mean, this idea has been around for a while, and we should really be able to exploit it and treat breast cancer in the best possible way. But it turns out that the devil's in the details, and it amounts to these arrows. So on the left side of these arrows, we have gigabytes of data containing a detailed molecular snapshot of a given woman's tumor, and on the right-hand side, we have a simple piece of information, which is what type of breast cancer a woman has. And linking the data to that information is not straightforward. And that's where statistics comes in. And in particular, I work to develop machine learning algorithms that, that help us put together these arrows. So machine learning is a field that's at the interface of statistics and computer science. And you might have heard of machine learning, but if you haven't, you use it all the time. So if you search for something on Google, then Google uses a, a machine learning algorithm to determine what search results to show you. Or if you buy something on Amazon, Amazon might recommend future purchases, again, using a machine learning algorithm. Or if you came here on the 520 bridge, the state of Washington took a photo of your license plate and they digitally read your license plate number so that they can send you a bill. And again, that's a machine learning algorithm. So I develop machine learning algorithms not to help Google show you better search results or to help Amazon sell products, but to transform this molecular data into useful information that we can use in order to better treat patients. So why is this so hard? I mean, why do you need to, to be a statistician and have an advanced degree in this to do this? Well, you know, it doesn't really seem that hard, right? Let's say instead of gigabytes of data, we just had two measurements for each patient. So for each woman with breast cancer, we measure protein one and protein two. And what I'm show, I'm a statistician, so I have to show at least one scatter plot. Um, so what I'm showing here is a scatter plot where we have 30 women, each with a different type of breast, each with one of the three types of breast cancer, and their protein levels are indicated on the plot. And we can see that the women with the green type of cancer all have pretty similar protein levels, as do the women with the red type and the women with the blue type. So if a new woman walks into the clinic, indicated with the X, it's pretty easy to see that she has the red type of breast cancer, so I'm gonna give her that treatment and we'll be done. But what if instead of two proteins, we have three proteins? Okay, you know, now we're in a three-dimensional scatter plot, but we can still look at the picture, and we still see that women with a given type of breast cancer all have pretty similar protein levels. And so a woman walks into the clinic, and we say that she has the green type of breast cancer, and we determine what treatment is best based on that information. But the problem is we don't just have three proteins for which we have measurements we might have 200 proteins for which we have measurements. And that's a lot of scatter plots. And even a really devoted grad student might start to grumble if you ask them to make you all of those scatter plots. I can tell you from experience. <laughs> um, and they'll really be unhappy if you also give them 25,000 gene expression measurements. And do not ask them to look at three billion base pairs of DNA data. So this is a vast amount of information and, I mean, this is one reasonable way to respond. But it isn't the only response, because there are tools that we can use. And there's statistical ideas, and there's machine learning algorithms that we can use to try to understand this data. And this is really just such an exciting time, because we have this vast amount of data. This is data that would have been unthinkable before. But now we have these incredibly powerful molecular tools that allow us to obtain this data, and all we need to do is turn it into information. But, of course, life is always more complicated than you'd like to think. And so I just want to say, you know, I showed this simple model for breast cancer where there's three types of breast cancer, um, but that might have been wishful thinking. Because maybe this is a better model for breast cancer. Maybe there's 25 different types of breast cancer. Or maybe it's even worse. Maybe there's an infinite number of types of breast cancer, one for every woman who has breast cancer. Because maybe no two women have the same disease. And so we need really flexible statistical models that can tackle this sort of heterogeneity and really make sense of it. Or maybe the situation's even more complicated, because maybe even within a given woman, her breast cancer isn't homogeneous. Maybe breast cancer is actually made up of a lot of different types of cells, and there's heterogeneity within cancer, really at a cellular level, that we're gonna need to be able to address. And so I just wanna close by saying, you know, this is just such an exciting time, because we've heard now that there's just this vast amount of data out there 
And in particular, there's this vast amount of data in biology. And it used to be that biologists were limited by what sorts of data they could collect. So they, you know, there were questions they could answer based on the data that they had, but a lot of questions were just totally unanswerable. And now that in this paradigm shift, now the data's there, and biologists are able to collect all of the data they could possibly want to answer any question that they could possibly think of. That might be a slight exaggeration, but it's pretty close. But the problem is having the data isn't good enough. It's just gigabytes on a hard drive until you know what to do with the data once you've got it. And so this is such an exciting time, both in and out of the interface of biology and statistics. Thank you.